Dennis Dugard has been very busy touring the state of South Dakota from April to June, hosting six different workforce summits. Joining us bright and early in studio now is News Center 1's Caroline Patricas, who gets the very first report from the governor himself. Good morning, Caroline. Well, good morning to you, Jessica. As mentioned earlier today, Governor Dugard releases the Workforce Summit reports and is now just hours away from going on a two-day tour to talk to communities about those results. Joining us now is Governor Dennis Dugard to talk about those Workforce Summit results. So, Governor, your first stop is obviously here in Rapid City. Can you talk about why those uh, Workforce Summits were initiated in the first place? Sure. Last fall I was visiting with business leaders around the state and in several separate instances there were uh, comments from those business leaders that they were having trouble hiring workers, that they had regained sales at the recession, they had uh, added jobs back, but now uh, one of the constraints on their ability to grow was the ability to hire workers. And it wasn't that there weren't people looking for work, there were, it's just that the skill sets that those workers had didn't match the job openings that were available. And so we resolved to uh, go out to the communities and we had a series of six different summits around the communities uh, in which we presented demographic information about the, our situation here in South Dakota compared ourselves to other states and uh, brainstormed, if you will, with each of those communities about what we could do to address this challenge. Now, Governor, what, um, what challenges does South Dakota have versus other states? Well, it's true that other states are seeing these workforce challenges just as much as South Dakota. Um, Yet South Dakota's problem is a little bit exacerbated by our good economy. We have a very strong and growing economy. Our unemployment rate now is 3.7%, uh, it's fourth lowest in the nation. And so when you have fewer people looking for jobs, it's all that much more important that those people have the skill sets for the job openings that are available. Now you mentioned earlier that this is our first workforce summit that we have ever done here in the state of South Dakota. So how uh, or what did you learn as a result of doing these summits? Well, uh, well, first of all, we heard from uh, our employers and learned that probably the most important thing that we can do is uh, a better job of matching up skill sets and openings and developing those skill sets. Uh, we also learned that uh, uh, employers need better uh, ways of attracting workers. We can't just use the old want ads anymore. We need to have better methods for employers to uh, reach out to those who are available and find them, connect them with jobs, hire them and retain them. Mm -hmm. We also learned that we need to help young people, especially young people who are making their decisions about uh, their career paths, uh, as they're embarking on post-secondary education, we need to help them understand where the job opportunities lie and where they don't lie. So that as you reach the end of your uh, tech school uh, program or your college program, you don't get out into the world of work and find, gosh, I've studied for two or four years mm -hmm. to gain a degree in a field. There's not much demand mm -hmm. in this field. So we want to help them. We don't want to tell people what their dreams are. We want them to pursue the paths they want to pursue, but we want them to have their eyes open. Absolutely. Now going forward, now that we have these results in, what can, we, what can the state do next? Well, one of the reasons why I'm in Rapid City today mm -hmm. and will be in other uh, five communities over the next two days is to report back to the communities what we learned collectively from the six workforce summits that we had uh, this summer. And then also to identify four communities uh, self-assessments that they can do with the state to help us work together on addressing this problem jointly and working together rather than at cross purposes. So one of the tools that we have in the Workforce Summit Report is a self-assessment checklist that we as a state are going to go through and self-evaluate and that we're asking communities also to go through and self-evaluate. And then we want communities to develop their own uh, plans that the state can help support, uh, whether it be encouraging young people to understand the workforce opportunities and what career paths are best or whether it be uh, recruiting and a, a different uh, approach to going to 
other states or other locales and recruiting workers in or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And finally, my last question on the topic of the Workforce Summit's results is what can communities do now that we have these results in? What can we do? Well, one thing we learned is uh, it, it makes sense for us to work together. Mm -hmm. The education community needs to work with the business community and government needs to work with both of them. And collectively, if we work together and have a common strategy and are working on parallel tracks along those same strategies, we're going to have much more effect. If the state goes down one path and thinks here's the solution to our workforce problem and a community goes down another path and we don't work together we're going to be less effective working together is always a good now let's turn to a growing concern it's a really hot topic the rail backlog now my understanding is that farmers are having a hard time getting grain to move due to a rail car shortage so governor what can you tell me about what may have caused this shortage well first of all we've had a lot of um, increased activity in the economy and so shipping overall is is up. In this area of the country, we're also seeing a lot of competition from oil shipments. So we've got locomotives that are pulling uh, tank cars as opposed to grain cars. And then also the last uh, winter weather that we had last winter, uh, the cold weather makes trains brake systems work less efficiently and so you need to shorten tr trains up and go slower so that created bottlenecks and that was exacerbated by the winter weather in Chicago. Um, and then on top of that, we've got a 1.1 billion uh, bushel grain harvest mm -hmm. in 2013, and it looks like this year is going to be just as, as good. So uh, lots of volume, lots of competition for rail. And then finally, here in the Rapid City area and the Black Hills area, we're seeing uh, that impact of uh, the handoff from the Canadian Pacific to the Rapid City Pier and Eastern uh, short line. And that handoff occurred right as the wheat harvest was starting to kick in. So just at a time when we needed uh, better grain car service and a little bit more volume because of the terrific harvest, we're actually seeing a little bit of a hiccup in the handoff. Mm -hmm. Now what have you done in response to this problem? Do we have any solutions in the making yet? Well, even before the handoff, we could see the, the volumes uh, and the bottlenecking from the winter being a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, I sent my Ag Secretary, uh, Lucas Lynch, to Washington, D.C. to meet with the Surface Transportation Board. Uh, we, our senior staff, met with their senior staff here in South Dakota. I personally was in uh, Washington to meet with the uh, CEO, uh, of the Canadian Pacific Railroad and the Chief Operating Officer of the Rapid City Pier and Eastern Railroad. And uh, th that pair, those two leaders, agreed to uh, step up their efforts uh, with trains. They were normally expecting to have about tr uh, seven trains a week leave South Dakota on the RCP and E line. And they promised to step it up to 10 trains a week, add three extra trains. And in fact, uh, two weeks ago, they were at 11 trains. A week. So we know they're working harder and we're seeing much better service on that line. So does that mean that the situation is improving then? I think it's going to be improving. At the same time, you have to recognize that these extraordinary harvests are going to be increasingly the norm. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to take the railroad some time to step up their capital investment, to have enough locomotives, to have enough train cars, to serve that growing grain shipment uh, market. And so in the meantime, maybe for the next year or two, we're going to encourage our shippers and our producers to expect to store more grain than you may normally have planned to store and in places maybe you weren't planning to store it. And so um, finally on this topic, what can we expect from here going forward? Well, we're going to continue to encourage our rail uh, railroads to provide extraordinary service, not just ordinary, but we need a little better than has been the norm. And we've also got the results of a state rail plan that are coming out this fall. Uh, last fall, I initiated a, a complete review of all the rail that we have in South Dakota, including the state-owned uh, rail lines in South Dakota and that report is online right now. Some of it is in draft form mm -hmm. and partially complete online and the rest of it will be complete this year and that will help us identify the priority areas where good investments will help relieve this uh, bottlenecking. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Governor. Thank you so much for your time. We understand that you're very busy and we here at News Center One always appreciate what you do. So thanks for joining us on this very special edition of News Center One.